Good morning. PM Grace. Hallelujah. Before we start the service, I'd like to welcome our sister Rosalind Das. Let's give a big hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. This morning, before we start the service, I just thought um, that we use some of our imagination. Is that okay? Have you ever thought about what it will be like when we meet Jesus face to face? Physically, I mean. Have you ever given it a thought? What would it be like if we are expecting Him to come in at 11 a.m.? Through that door. Physically. Right? I imagine everyone would be anxiously waiting. Those who haven't been to church in a while, knowing that He's coming, they will be here. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just saying that how we would behave, right? It's all imagination. <laughs> I imagine everyone would put on extra effort in everything they do. The musicians would have practice and practice to get all the songs perfect, to welcome and worship Him. The ushers and greeters would put on their best clothing. They will provide the best seat for Him. I imagine we will bring friends, our sick loved ones. There will be no room for those who are still coming to see Him. Upper room, Zion room will be packed. I imagine so packed that the stairways, people will be standing along the stairways. I imagine the area around Feast and Furious will be packed with people. I imagine people will be standing across the road on the other side and all along the main road just hoping to catch a glimpse of Him. I imagine that as soon as He walks through that door, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord because of the glory that is emanating from His presence. Well, Jesus says that He does this every week. Whenever we come together, He says that when two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of them. These words are spirit and they are the truth. They can't be perceived as true by our five senses. But only by our spirit. With that, let us worship Him in spirit and in truth. Let us allow our spirit man to dominate in our worship of Him. The flesh says, no, He's not here. But our spirit man says, He is here. According to His word, He is in our midst. Let us put the spiritual realm which we can't see with our own eyes. Let, it, let us make it more real than the physical realm around us right now. Let us just spend a few moments Quietly praying in the Spirit, shall we? Let us quietly pray in the Spirit. Let's begin to stir our spirit man. Soteros, 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 
Stir up the gift that is in you. The gift of tongues that the Lord has given you. Stir it up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that we, when we pray in tongues, we are speaking to God. We are speaking mysteries. Hallelujah. The things, the remarkable secrets that the Father desired to reveal to us. Oh, wonderful things when we pray in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, let our spirit man be edified. Let our spirit man dominate. Let us begin to worship you in spirit and in truth. Stand with me, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory, glory. Let your glory, let your glory. Oh, just feel this place, Lord. So Oh, hallelujah. Inhabit the praises of your people, O oh God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, church. We want to lift him up today. Amen. For we are all here in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let there be joy. Let there be freedom in this place today. Hallelujah.
your word is true and your word is alive and your word is working in us we thank you oh God all the weight of his glory all the wonder of his grace the power of salvation Pulled me from the grave. This hope is not empty, and forever He will reign. He won't be put to shame. Oh, my soul, sing to the God of the ages, sing to the Lord of creation, sing His praise again. Oh. Roar like an army 
Yeah. 
He's called the Lion of Judah. He's powerful. Against the enemy, they don't stand a chance against him. He's gentle like a lamb. And he says to us, I am the good shepherd. And you are my sheep. The shepherd who has compassion on his sheep. Jesus, you are worthy to receive all the glory. Our mind could not comprehend what you did on the cross for us. But let our spirit adore you and give thanks to you and worship you and acknowledge that you are worthy. We are reminded by the song that He is the God of our future. That He has written our story. Every one of us, our story is written in a book and the story is unfolding and BM Grace there is a story about BM Grace and it is unfolding you are the God of our future we trust in you when we don't understand we acknowledge you, the God of BM, BM Grace, our God. Our God who established us. Our God who leads us. Our God who will make a way when there is no way. Our God who will make the impossible possible. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for your presence, Lord. For your comforting presence. When the storms of life come against us, we know you are in our boat. We know you have got it taken care of. Hallelujah. We praise you. Let's give him all the glory, church. Hallelujah. You may be seated. As we partake of the communion, His Word tells us in John chapter 10, He says, I am the good shepherd and know my own sheep and they know me. Everybody say, they know me. <laughs> we know Him, amen. Just as my Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In verse 27 to 28, it says, My sheep recognize my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Everybody say, never perish. No one 
shall snatch them away from me. He has forever secured our salvation. Amen. I just want to unpack these verses a little bit. Jesus displays His deep compassion for us in the book of John by describing Himself as the Good Shepherd and we are His sheep. We are incapable of saving ourselves from the wrath of God that is to come. We are not capable at all. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 7, the good that, we, that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not to do, that I do. There's no way we can save ourselves. There's no way we can ex escape the wrath of God on our own. And that's why our shepherd chose to lay down his life for us. The Bible says the penalty of sin is death. And he paid the penalty with his life. He appeased, he appeased the wrath of God against sin and gave us eternal life. Why? So that we will not perish. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. And He reassures us that no one can snatch us from Him, our Good Shepherd. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink it. Let us receive that into our spirit that He is our shepherd who has compassion on us. Amen. For tithes and offer, uh, offer tree, I'd like to read to you from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 10. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Brothers and sisters, this is either true or it's a lie. There's no grey area. Our flesh says the church is asking for money again. That's what our flesh likes to say. Doesn't it? But the Spirit says, Lord, I am obeying your word so that I may see the truth of your word manifesting in my life. Amen. 
Which voice do you listen to? Hallelujah. For those who are giving online, there's information on the screen. And um, before I go on to the next thing, I'll just like to make a small announcement also. But uh, before that, let us pray. Father, thank you for the offerings. For, thank you for the finances coming into your kingdom. It is for you. It is to acknowledge you. It is to acknowledge, to test you that your word is true. Hallelujah. That you do what you say. Father, bless BM Grace. In every area, Lord, we're all supplied. That our vats overflow. Amen. That our barns are filled with plenty. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, announcement. On the 3rd of September, right here in Upper Room, there is an event called um, Volunteer Day. Am I right? Or is there another name? <laughs> A Volunteer Night, right. Um, as Brother Clarence has shared with us yesterday, um, we have so many people in different congregation. We serve the Lord, but we hardly know each other. Yeah. So the volunteer night will be for all who are serving in, in ministries to come together. Come together to know one another. Hallelujah. So that we can help each other. We don't have to look at them and say hi and bye. We will have a name. We will have a person that we can talk to. We can call upon when we need help or when we can help. Hallelujah. So make time for that event on the 3rd of September, 8 p.m., Upper Room. And um, next, I'd like to welcome Elder Thomas as he shares the word with us. <laughs> Thank you, Elder Paul. Good morning, all. For the 3rd of September, if you don't mind coming for a small party, even though you may not yet be serving and so on, just come. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Something incredible happened at the cross. At the cross, he became the curse. It is difficult to imagine. We hear of shamans or bomos that can place a curse and some people practice black magic, you know. But he became the curse. The curse that Adam brought on himself and on the whole of creation because of rebellion, because of sin. And then everyone, everything is infected, affected, Sin and death reign. But at the cross, he became. And he says that that is the wisdom of God. The wisdom that he had, who, the God, God who knows all things, exercised in his perfect knowledge and will to do this thing, which is his wisdom to solve the sin problem. So at the cross, he became the curse. And Galatians 3 tells us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. You might think, hey, if the blessing of Abraham comes upon the Jews, well, that's understandable, right? <laughs> comes upon Anak Sarawak, comes upon all the Gentiles in this land, I mean, if you're not Anak Sarawak, never mind, you're seated here, so you're a Gentile, you're included. <laughs> is, that, is that incredible? It's a promise by the Spirit through faith. Why? Because thousands of years ago, God promised to Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth, which is including us, shall be blessed. Amen. And so 1 Corinthians 1, 
tells us that in this wisdom of God, that we who are found in Christ benefited from that wisdom that God did. Christ, his life, his sacrifice became or is the wisdom of God that is now our inheritance. And as a result of that, we have been made righteous. That means we have a right standing with God as if we never sinned. All, all, all the stuff that Adam brought on us is actually no more. It's, it's difficult to imagine, right? <laughs> you know, last week I was tested positive for COVID. That's why I can't come. And yet, God says, I'm blessed. That is a temporary nuisance, right? I will not dwell in it because he has provided the healing and the way out. But the eternal position is, I am righteous. Because of the wisdom of God, Christ himself. Then he says that I am also sanctified. I'm set aside. I can't set aside myself for God. You know, I mean, to, to prepare a Sunday message, that's one thing. But I also have a trail of other imperfections. Amen. So to set myself aside is like, man, <laughs> you can try you probably fail in the process. But Jesus doesn't leave any quarters undone. He sanctified us, made us holy, blameless before God by His blood. Amen. And finally, He is our redemption. We are no longer our own. We are His prized possession. And so we are Christ. Hallelujah. We're no longer our own. We are His. And so we are blessed. Amen. We are blessed. And that's why we worship Him. We give Him thanks. We bless Him. We give Him a tithe and an offering. Just like, just like Abraham blessed Melchizedek. I know you guys enjoyed uh, Dr. Charles Stanley last week. He talked about um, God and our money, and he he touched on on tithing, which is not a not an easy subject. So I want to add a little bit more to what he has said, not to dilute or but but just to enhance. Abraham, when he came back, having defeated five kings and got his nephew back and, and got everything back, actually, he was met by a man called Melchizedek. His name means righteousness. He is the king of Salem. He is the king of peace. And this, this man is also the priest of the Most High God. He suddenly appeared. And then he meets Abraham and he brought with him bread and wine. And then he blessed him. Who does that remind you of? This is the Christ incarnate. This is God in the person of Melchizedek appearing to him before he became man. Amen. What did he do? He blessed, blessed Abraham and said to him, Blessed be Abram of God most high. So this is not the first time Abraham is hearing a blessing, right? He has heard that voice before. He knows that it is the God who blesses him, the God of blessing for him. He has set up altars before. Amen. So this word of blessing to him is in a way not new. But the person that has appeared to him looks different. Amen. Blessed be Abram of God most high. Remember I said that the wisdom of God in Christ made us righteous, sanctified us, and has redeemed us. And because of that, we are blessed because of the blessing of Abraham. Or can I just allow your imagination, as encouraged by Elder Paul just now, that Melchizedek has just met you. That the king of Salem has just brought blessing, bread and wine to you 
and call you blessed. How, how, how about that? How about that? The blessing of Abraham, right? Is it a blessing of Abraham? That Melchizedek has blessed him. Possessor of heaven and earth. We have an inheritance which shall dwell with him forever. Co-heirs. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Your blessing not only has possessions and success, your blessing also has destroyed your enemies. Amen. Is poverty an enemy? Is sickness and disease and oppression and depression and all, 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 all the things because of Adam's sin and the devil that promotes it is an enemy? Am I correct? He robs our peace. He inflicts pain. He takes things away, destroys our joy, upsets everything. He comes to kill, steal, destroy. And Jesus, I come to give you life and life more abundant. That's, that's, that's the blessing. And so I want all of us to be reminded, myself included, <laughs> of our privilege and our inheritance, our position, the promise, the words spoken over us, which is blessing. Not that we are obsessed with just blessing alone and being unrealistic. No. It's because that is who God wants us to be. Blessed. Amen. So, <laughs> Can I encourage all of us that if that is not in your mind that you do a repentance and shift your thinking and say, I am blessed. Because God says so. Amen? Hey, come on, you guys are kind of quiet. <laughs> Help me out here. I am blessed because God says so. Regardless of past. It is everything to do with the present. Let the present undo your past. Amen. So that you are free into the now and the future. After all, we're going to spend eternity with him, right? You might, might as well get used to it. Now, for all of this, for all of these things, that when Abraham met with Melchizedek, king of Salem, Abraham gave him a tithe. This is the first mention. In other words, the first time in the Bible that the tithe is mentioned is here in Genesis 14, verse 20. So what's the tithe then? The tithe is Abraham's acknowledgement of who God is. And at that, on that day, he was represented, God was represented by Melchizedek, a high priest. We have in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. There are many, many verses, but I just take one. The summary is this. Jesus is our great high priest. Melchizedek was him pre-incarnate. They are the one and the same. Amen. So the writer to the Hebrews does not relegate Melchizedek to a figure in the past that has no relevance. He has told the Jewish people whom he's writing to, he's writing the letter to the Hebrews, but we benefit from it, right? That this Melchizedek is a very, very special, unique person. He is Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, no doubt. But nevertheless, Jesus Christ in Hebrews 7 Verses 4 to 10, it reads like this. I'll put up a little bit of bracket um, to try and designate who, who, who the passage is talking about. Starting from verse 4. Now consider how this man, how great he is, this Melchizedek, this pre-incarnate Christ. Consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. If Abraham honored him with the tenth of the spoils, he must be somebody important. Correct? And he is somebody important that Abraham has recognized and this important person has released kind words of blessing and assurance to him. 
And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment from Moses, that is, to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, that's Israel, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. What all he says is this. Here is Abraham giving to Melchizedek. Then according to the law of Moses, there is a commandment that the Levites who are serving God, they have a commandment to receive tithes from their brethren, from Israel. So that is the religious performance as a result of Moses. But it was preceded by Abraham giving to Melchizedek. Verse 6, but he, Melchizedek, whose genealogy is not derived from them. In other words, Melchizedek is not from the tribe of Levi. He is before Moses. He already exists. He received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. In other words, Abraham sets the pace, sets the example. Moses comes later on with the law, and the whole of Israel follows it. Why are they following? They're following Father Abraham. Amen. So, he says, beyond all contradiction, the lesser, which is Abraham, is blessed by the better. The one who is better blesses the lesser one. Amen. Here, mortal men receive tithes. Our ushers. <laughs> In the Old Testament, uh, it'll be a little bit different, but I explain that. Here we receive tithes, but there he, Melchizedek, receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. In other words, we are carrying on this law, this tradition, this response to the God who's blessing us with our tithes because of what Abraham did. And all of this then, because Melchizedek is a type of Jesus Christ. We are doing all of these things because Jesus is alive. Amen. So the tithe then is neither Old Testament or New Testament. The tithe is our response to God who blesses us. Amen. And the testimony is that He lives. We are not performing a religious duty because in pagan religions, even today, you give offerings to the temple. You give money, you give rice, you give oil, and various things. Yeah? So that the temple administration and so on and so forth, the things that they do, can happen. Well, in a way, in the Old Testament, it wasn't different. God, who owns all things, who created all things, chose Israel to be his own people, gave them a set of rules and regulations, right? Bring in the tithe. There's no negotiation of net or gross, whatever. It's just bring in the tithe. Bring in your produce. Why? So that the Levites have something to eat. So that the whole temple process, the feast of the Lord, all of these things can happen. Wheat and barley and, and animal sacrifice, the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, everything else flows. So that God, when he sees these things, not that he requires it, it is an excuse for him, what? To release the blessing. He is the one that gives you the rain. He is the one that give, makes your soil fertile. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That increases your crops that you have the best breed. Hallelujah. And so everyone who is found obedient to that simple instruction through faith in Jesus Christ taps into the blessing. Amen. And so we encourage all of us to tithe. It's not New Testament. It's not Old Testament. It is God's way. Amen. Amen. Of course, now we, are, we have a market economy that's a little bit different, right? We don't, uh, uh, well, some parts of SIB, we still do that. They tithe rice and chickens and stuff like that because when you have an agricultural economy when there's not much cash, you bring what you have. So Israel will bring whatever they have. Amen? And so we'll bring what we have. 
Hallelujah. So we tithe once a month. If at the end of the year we have a bonus and we have a dividend and stocks and shares and bonds and whatever have you, hallelujah, bless the Lord. Because Melchizedek says this, blessed be Abram of God most high. That's directed to, to Abraham, right? Possessor of heaven and earth. Then it says what? Blessed be God most high. <laughs> Who has delivered your enemies into your hand? God is fighting on your side. So the enemy is not God. If anybody is treating you unjustly, there is a force behind that. And cry out to God. He hears. When Israel was in miserable trouble because of their rebellion and idolatry, when they came to their senses, they cried out to God. Help! You know what God did? God helped. <laughs> Even though they were less than perfect. So what does that mean? And that means all of us have got a jolly good chance. Amen. Hallelujah. And through Christ, we have the benefit of the indwelling Holy Spirit and so on. Praise you, Jesus. Anyhow, so that, that's my little bit of introduction to just tag on from where Charles Stanley left off yesterday. Um, he, he took Proverbs chapter 3 as the opening, as his anchor, anchor passage, right? Verses 5 to 10. That's what Charles Stanley did. Actually, I was preparing a message, but I couldn't use it because I was tested positive, right? So, so I thought, okay, Charles Stanley, you go and do it on my behalf. Because I was actually studying Proverbs chapter 3. In fact, preceding that, Proverbs 1 and 2. Uh, so I couldn't do it, so he goes first, and so I'm not going to continue from behind. <clears throat> um, my title is this. Find wisdom, that's what Proverbs says. I'll, I'll give you the verse in a minute. Find wisdom, gain understanding. It's better than silver and gold. You know, we talk about tithes and offerings and blessings. We tend to think currencies and think, we tend to think monies and assets and silver and gold and cash and stuff. All right? That, that's, that's fine. These things on their own is not evil. It's, it, it's, it's an asset. God created it. That's fine. But it's something else. Find wisdom. Then we, we may have a question like, what's that? Gain understanding. Understanding of what? Because... They are better than silver and gold. That's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. It reads like this. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. Let's read it again. Happy is the man, that includes the woman as well. Happy is the man or the woman who finds wisdom. So, wisdom can be found. Right, you, you can't say, I have no wisdom. Well, go and find it. <laughs> How do I find it? Ask God. He knows all about it. And Christ has become to us wisdom from God. And we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Amen. So all of it is in the scriptures and we have the Holy Spirit of truth to help us along. So he, wisdom can be found. And happy is the man who does that. And the man who gains understanding. So the Hebrew language of the Bible has one line, then the next line helps to explain the line above. So with wisdom comes what? Comes understanding. So wisdom carries with it an understanding. Right, And her proceeds are better than profits of silver. Now here we have the feminine noun. Uh, I'll try to explain this without being too sidetracked. Side there are some languages, some European languages included, and the Hebrew language whereby you use uh, feminine nouns or masculine nouns. It doesn't exist in English. All right? So in the Hebrew language, then wisdom is a feminine noun. That's why... In the English translation, you get wisdom represented by her or she. All right? So, 
So it, it's, it's a language, it's a grammar thing, and I'll leave it at that. You can research further. Okay. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. Hallelujah. That's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. That's a caption uh, of where my title comes from. Now, I want to bring us to read from verse 1 down to 18. It's, a, it's, it's the same, same Proverbs. And my, my Bible has a subheading that says, Guidance for the Young. Uh, those who are not so young, let us be guidance also. Those who are young, if you're single or you're a uh, young adult or you just married, you've got young kids, whatever it is, this is guidance. You find wisdom, you gain understanding, you got something good going for you. Amen. Verse 1. <clears throat> my son, my daughter, do not forget my law. Now, I know we are Grace Church and so on and so forth. When the Bible tells us, do not forget my law, it means exactly that. Do not forget the teachings of God. Do not forget the teachings of Jesus Christ. It's nothing to try and bring us back to sin and bondage. It's so that we get to know God. Amen. Let us explain. Wisdom and understanding comes from a process of knowledge. Right? And some people say that wisdom is knowledge applied. So it infers to us that there is a knowledge that needs to be gained. And to, to summarize it all later on, we'll, we'll see. The knowledge is the knowledge of God. So if you say, oh, this is law. I'm under grace. I'm New Testament. So I have nothing to, more to do with the law. You'll really seriously misunderstand Scripture. Okay, let's leave it at that. Do not forget my law. But let your heart keep my commands. Jesus says there's only one command left, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Because there's only one command of love, right? But we can't do that if we don't understand the context of who God is, what has he done, how has he released that love, how he has manifested that love to us for us to be able to obey the command. Am I correct? There's a whole process there. My son, do not forget the law, but let your heart keep my commands. didn't say use your head. Let your heart keep my commands. So our heart must be bent in the search of him, in our relationship with him. Keep his commands. For length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Hey, that's not bad, right? <laughs> that's not bad. Uh, Matthew, you, 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 you. I've got gray hairs, you have less. But I tell you what, length of days and long life and peace, they'll add to you. Amen? Amen. Uh, all of us are of our, this particular generation. <laughs> hey, son. <laughs> Anyhow, it's, it's, it's encouraging. Am I correct? It's not to do with difficult religious laws and regulations and beat yourself, that kind of stuff. He says, do not forget my law. Let your heart keep my commands. The length of days and long life and peace they'll add to you. Surely you want to read some more, right? Amen? <laughs> Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them round your neck. Write them on a tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of man and God. Well, hey, look, this is what favor here. That's grace. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Who is mercy and truth? Jesus, right? He is full of grace and truth, and grace is sometimes translated mercy. Let not Jesus depart from you. Hold on to him. Let him be your overall revelation of everything. Bind it around your neck. Maybe this is why some people wear crosses. But if you do wear a cross, you don't know the reason why, but at least this gives you a reason why. <laughs> Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Remember the laws, the laws that were written on the heart of stone in the Old Testament because there was no Holy Spirit, there's no blood of Jesus Christ. They were doing things on their own and they just couldn't do it. Right? You cannot save yourself. But because of Jesus Christ, He has circumcised our heart. Amen? And given us a heart of flesh. 
Hallelujah. So now we can write, we can write, He loves me and went to the cross for me. We can write that I have His life in me. I have His favor, I have His blessing in me, and so on and so forth. We can write in our hearts the benefits of what we have found. And so find favor and high esteem. Where does that come from? It comes from Jesus Christ, not letting Him out of your sight. Amen? And the benefits of the finished work of the cross, keep it close to your heart. Say it, bless yourself by it. Amen? Then mountains will be reduced, valleys will be raised, crooked path made straight, and you find favor for you. Amen. God on your side. Not your own pandai, but God on your side. Hallelujah. Then this is the, the part that uh, Charles uh, took from, and of course, Elder Paul read it as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Having gone through the process of verses 1 to 4, trust Him with all your heart, with everything. You see the heart, the word heart is mentioned more than a few times. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your un understanding. It's not about your knowledge, it's about His knowledge. He's all-knowing. It's not about your wisdom or what other people say or what the experience has been. He has His way of doing things and if He's showing you something different or the, you come across that the Bible says something different, then lean not on your own understanding. You've got to trust Him. And a few weeks ago, we read this, we, uh, we, I shared this from Gideon, right? Gideon seriously had to trust Him because everything that God was telling him didn't make sense. He thought he was the weakest and the least. And the angel says, Hello, men of valor. What? <laughs> Anyhow, that's a different story. Trust him. It may be counterintuitive. It may not make sense. But if it's from God, trust him. Because he is mercy, he is truth. He has favor for you. Amen. He loves you and went to the cross. He is wisdom of God for you. You have the mind of Christ. Put these things and many other things together. Trust Him. Lean not on your un, on your, uh, in your own understanding. And then the way to trust Him and lean not on your own understanding is this. Verse 6. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. Don't put Him aside. Make Him front and center. He is your God. Am I correct? In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Amen. Your next appointment or your next interview or your whatever. Amen. Yesterday, oh no, no, hang on. No, no, just two, two or three days ago, I read in the newspaper that our premier has, there's some announcement that over the next uh, number of years, um, it's going to inject X billion ringgits into our, our state because of infrastructure and so on and so forth. So I just whispered this prayer to God. I said, uh, I would like a, a small piece of that action, if you don't mind. I, I can't tell you exactly which is what, because a lot of it is very big as well, well, well beyond me, right? But so long as my office is still running and that's the way you're going to keep it, then I don't mind having a small part of that. Amen. And so I said, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You know, um, because the Bible says I've got favor, right? I don't have to be more specific than that. I have my relationship with Him. I don't have to craft anything more difficult than to express what's in my heart. And then in, in that, it just means everything we just read. I trust Him. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding to write a letter to propose to who. I don't know who to write to. It's very general. But that's what the state has in plan, uh, has planned. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Give glory to Him. It's not about you. It's about Him. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Later on, we'll learn. We're going to learn about wisdom of God, not our own wisdom. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. The way not to be wise in your own eyes is to have reverence and awe for God 
and depart from evil. Depart, number one, from all forms of unbelief and all forms of compromise and rebellion. Amen. Just put yourself, you and him and him and you, and that's it. Especially if you want to win some big battles. And when all of this happens, verse 8, again, the surprise. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. How amazing. You think that, wow, all of this is going to generate millions into my bank account, right? <laughs> no, it says this is good for your health. Strength for your bones. Good to grow old with. Good to start off with. Amen. Then he says, honor the Lord with your possessions. It means as far as God is concerned, you have possessions. Say, I have possessions. I have possessions. Yeah, I just have to honor God with my possessions. Amen. You can't say, I have no possessions. Well, you have God. He is your possession. He owns everything. You have God, right? If you don't have God, well, have him. <laughs> have him. I'll lead you to sinner's prayer later on. Honor the Lord with the possessions and with the fruits. Sorry. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. How do you honor? With the first fruit of all of your increase. All the blessing that comes your way. Everybody's blessing comes in different ways, different manners, and so on and so forth. But in acknowledging Him, there is a way we can then uh, um, honor Him with the first fruits of our increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your barns will overflow with new wine. This is the gift and it will be given back to you. You know, shaken, pressed down, flowing, <laughs> and so on and so forth. This is God's wisdom. It's, it's upside down. You give to receive. Hallelujah. Now, verses 11 and 12. It says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. In all of this counseling that the writer, the Proverbs, has written, he comes to this point and says, Look, if you've not got it quite right and the Lord corrects you, it's because he loves you. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord. The Lord will chasten us through his word by his spirit. He's not going to beat us and be cruel about it and so on and so forth because he loves us and he's given us his word. He's gentle, but he, if he, well, not say if, when we, when we need it, he, he'll give it to us. Amen. But do not uh, despise it, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. If you're receiving a correction, the first sign is he loves you. And he wants better for you. That he wants the best for you. Amen. He's advising you on some course correction. You know, some attitude and some fine tuning and so on and so forth. Maybe our relationship, the way we perceive things, the things that we've said, the things we've judged. He makes all these corrections so that it flows. His blessing, which is what it's all about, flows. Just as a father, the son in whom he dies. Then here comes, here comes the title of the message. Happy is he who finds wisdom. So all that process there contains wisdom. That is the process of wisdom. You find wisdom and a man who gains understanding for her proceeds are better than profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. All the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Get this one right, the rest flows. And what flows will <laughs> overflow you. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. Amen. This is not too abstract, right? This is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Now, just uh, 
bit of clarification about wisdom and knowledge because sometimes we get and the word understanding and we just wonder like which is which. I hope this helps, okay? Wisdom and knowledge, both recurring themes in the Bible are related but are not synonymous. Wisdom is not knowledge and knowledge is not wisdom. Knowledge can exist without wisdom but not the other way around. One can be knowledgeable without being wise. For example, knowledge is knowing how to use a gun. Wisdom is knowing when to use it and when to keep it holstered. All right? You can have knowledge, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have wisdom. I can have a university degree that says that I got lots of knowledge, right? Years invested in there. But it doesn't automatically mean that I got wisdom to do everything right and perfectly. Knowledge is what is gathered over time through study of the scriptures, especially here we're talking about God. Knowledge is what is gathered over time through the study of scriptures. It can be said that wisdom in turn acts properly upon that knowledge. So the knowledge we are talking about here essentially is the knowledge of God. Not so much how to do math and science and so on and so forth. Although God is all-knowing, He's omniscience, He's all science. <laughs> He's all-knowing, but it's this one we're talking about, the knowledge of God, rather than a specific area or field of expertise. Knowledge is what is gathered over time through the study of scriptures. It can be said that wisdom, in turn, acts properly upon that knowledge. Wisdom is the fitting application of knowledge. Knowledge understands the light has turned red. Wisdom applies the brakes. Knowledge of God's law and commands tells you avoid certain things, run away from certain things. Right? It's just like saying you understand what red light means. And the red line is the red light is now in front of you in your life in that time frame. Hit the brakes. Because it's in front of you. If the red light is not in front of you and there are red lights everywhere, then you don't have to hit the brakes because it's not for you. But if it's for you, you must hit the brakes. Knowledge memorizes the Ten Commandments. You know what it is. Honor your parents and so on and so forth. Wisdom obeys them because there's long life in it. Amen? So it's not legalistic just to have commandments and so on and so forth and memorizing and just put your head full of stuff. Wisdom is to obey and let that obedience flow out of what's already in your heart and you'll be easy, right? Because all of it means you're on track with the blessing that's all around you. That's what the whole thing is. Knowledge learns of God. Wisdom loves Him because He's altogether lovely. Amen? Okay. So here are a few more examples in Proverbs, and I think I'm just going to read them because then, then I, I think the words are familiar, and we, we, we draw from God who wants to give wisdom to us. Proverbs 1 7 says this The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You know that God is the person from whom all good things come. You also know that He is the eternal judge. You also know that he is forgiveness and he is salvation. Without him, we cannot do anything. All right? So put that into perspective, have a reverential fear of him. And then take the necessary steps to respond to that truth. Because it says fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fool will just ignore all of those things and just carry on. And so without any reverence for God, you, you're going to live your own life and you're going to generate your own rewards for the life that you led because God is not there. So do not be a fool, but rather be a person who fears the Lord because that is the beginning of knowledge. Remember? With the knowledge, then you come the wisdom part. 
Proverbs 1, 20 to 33 says this. Oh no, 23, sorry. Wisdom calls aloud outside. In other words, you don't have to do Bible study to have wisdom knock at your heart. God cares in the square where this passage is, basically in your where your surround is. Wisdom is calling out so that you don't get into trouble. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the openings of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. So there is God's presence through our conscience uh, uh, calling us. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? In other words, when are you going to learn? <laughs> Remember, do not despise the Lord's corrections. <laughs> Scripture is telling us, why are you not learning? Why are you repeating the same, same mistakes? How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. And wisdom says, turn at my rebuke, turn at my warning, turn at my call, change course. Don't be silly, don't be a fool to remain there. You suffer the consequences, you are not following my way. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you, I will make my words known to you. Once you respond, then the spirit comes and helps us to comprehend. Amen? Is that helpful? Now remember, Proverbs, a lot of it is attributed to Solomon. He's writing this text, is from the context of Israel and God. It's a life's experience. Amen. And so we who are Gentiles, we read it and we learn from it. This is not something for Hebrew people only. This is universal. But the experience is set in the context of their history, God dealing with them as a nation, individually, as a corporation, as a king, and so on. And so there are all these wisdoms uh, and, and uh, pearls that are given to us. Proverbs 9 verse 10 to 12 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So wisdom is the knowledge of the Holy One, because that is your understanding. When you have the understanding, you know how to apply the knowledge. Amen. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. We read Psalm 23, we say, Oh, goodness and mercy shall chase us, shall follow us all the days of our life. Yes, because you've been wise. Because the Lord is your shepherd, you made him your shepherd. Amen. You have put your trust upon him. Even through the valley of the shadow of death, you are rested because he is by your side. Amen. This is all in the same harmony of things. Proverbs 10, verses 27 to 29 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs days. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. The hope of the righteous will be gladness. But the expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is strength for the upright. But destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. In other words, God has his way of identifying and separating those who are with him and those who are without. Amen. And so he has special favor to guide us through the course of life. If we don't tap into it, we don't see the benefits of it. But once we come to this understanding and we deliberately tap into it and remind ourselves of, the, of Jesus Christ who is the wisdom of God towards us, that we stand in righteousness with sanctification and redemption and all the benefits that there are, then our cause, our root in life will change. Amen. And because we're engaging Him, he will then make straight your path. Order your steps. Amen. And I'll line up favors and blessings to come to you. Because God is with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Very quickly. Then I'll, uh, in the New Testament, I've said many times to, uh, today, 1 Corinthians 1, 30-31, that Christ has become for us wisdom from God. In John 16, Jesus promised us 
uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit. He says he's the spirit of truth. And when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. So the spirit of God, remember, Abraham met Melchizedek, who is the pre-incarnate Christ. Then we have Jesus, who is the wisdom of God for us. And now we have the Holy Spirit in his place, doing exactly the same thing, a different person uh, of the Trinity, but carrying on the same purpose and mission. There's no con contradiction. The Holy Spirit in us reminds us of all, all, all this truth. Because He is the Spirit of truth. Amen? And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will also give us wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Ephesians 1 verse 17. I remember uh, Pastor Prince said this. He says, tithing is not for everybody. So I thought, hey, hang on, what are you talking about? His, his, his context is this. His context is you need to get a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ being our great high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Because the passage he's reading in Hebrew says, the writer of Hebrew says, look, you should know this. By now you should be aware of this, but you're not. So instead of taking solid food, you're just drinking milk. Because you have not got the revelation that Jesus is our great high priest of the order of Melchizedek. So through that, he says that when you get that revelation, tithing becomes easy or you, you know what to do. But those who don't have the revelation, maybe they have a bit of difficulty. Uh, but you have the revelation. I, I've just uh, put it together for us just, just, just now. Wisdom comes from God. He gives wisdom. James 1 verse 5 says, if you lack wisdom, ask from God. <laughs> That's simple enough, right? Ask from him. Uh, very quickly, I'll close with this. King Solomon. The wisest man who was not so wise after all in the end. He did everything right and he had the benefit of the legacy of his father. Right? A man after God's heart was King David, his father. So, Make the long story short, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? Remember, wisdom is for the asking. So <laughs> I'm going to repeat these words quite seriously. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord says, Ask, what shall I give you? One amen. The rest? Amen. Ask. Us, you have favor. You are righteous before God. You're set aside by His Holy Spirit. Amen? And you're redeemed by His blood. You can't get closer to God. You are seated at the right hand just where Jesus is. So in the Spirit, you, you are where God is. You, you can't get any closer. Right? So you don't have to do spiritual gymnastics and somersaults to get him to answer your prayer in case he doesn't hear. He hears. And today he's saying, ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon answered in 1 Kings 3, verses 9 to 14. He gives a reason why he's asking for those things because it's difficult to rule and he needs discernment. So he says, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this thing. So he was asking for what he needs because of his position as a king. How to rule this country? There's economics, there's military, there's defense, there is just about everything. There's agriculture, right? There's research, there's science. And like, man, this is too much for a young man. But thank you, you made me king. Thank you, you honored my late father. But man, my mind is blown. You really got to help me. I mean, my words. And God was happy with that because he was being very, very realistic and humble, right? He didn't go off on his high horse and, uh, and squander off his wealth. He didn't. So the Lord was happy with this. He said, because you've asked this thing, you have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. See, I've given you a wise and understanding heart, because that's what he asked for, 
so that there is not one like you before you, nor shall any, there be another one rise after you. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honour, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. He asked for wisdom. We just read that when you look for his wisdom with understanding, these other things come along, right? And so who wrote all these Proverbs? Solomon has a hand in it. This is his own personal experience. This part is important. And this part I think he missed. Verse 14. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments just as your father walked, then I will lengthen your days. In all the asking, in all the blessings and things that perplex him and the sense of responsibility that's upon him, and he felt the weight thereof, and so he asked God for the ability to discern good and evil for justice, how to rule. Amen. God says, that's fantastic. But I cannot help sensing that he may have missed something. God says, you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments, just as your father walked. God was reminding him. I'm, you know, if I was able, I would say, Solomon, why don't you add these few lines there? That I may also know your ways to keep your statutes and your commandments just like my father did. That, appears, that part appears to be missing. But these are lessons for us. Amen? This is not to critique Solomon, but it's a lesson for us because... 1 Kings 11 says this, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts from after their gods. Solomon clung to this in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. So he was tremendously successful. Nobody ever like him in terms of wisdom and wealth and success. But he also failed miserably and literally lost everything. I mean everything. After he died, there was civil war. And then idolatry continued and the nation was broken into two, the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes. The Assyrians came, took away into captivity the whole ten tribes. Then the Babylonians came. The Jerusalem was destroyed and everything was done. Nothing left. Nothing left. And Israel went to exile. So the glory of Solomon and King's glory just bang. Brothers and sisters in Christ, though we are under grace, this I think is important, do not shy away from understanding God to know His ways, to keep His statutes and His commandments. This is not to bring us back into bondage. It's to know Him. He revealed Himself in that manner and He wants us to be blessed and so we need to find His jive. <laughs> that's, that's a language we can use, right? Amen? And so flow with Him because He has promised us blessings already. Not that He just made up His mind yesterday, but He already determined this thousands of years ago when He spoke to Abraham, res responding to Abraham's belief. Amen. Let us pray. Solomon's conclusion in life was fear God and keep His commandments for this is man's all. After all he went through in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 he says fear God and keep His commandments for this is man's all. Let me read the title and insert Christ. Happy is the man in BM grace and the woman in BM grace who finds wisdom and who finds Christ. And the man or woman who gains understanding to have the mind of Christ. For your proceeds are better than profits of silver, and her gain better than fine gold. If you're not yet born again, today is a good day to ask Him to forgive you of sins and to invite Him into your life to be your Lord and Savior. 
in Jesus name Amen Hallelujah thank you elder for the words of wisdom may we gain understanding amen all right shall i invite you all to stand as we sing this closing song together truth has come he will lead you to all truth amen. amen and he will tell you of things to come he will take whatever belongs to Jesus and will then make it known to us so there's no no secret the Lord wants to bless us he went to the cross to make it possible 
and the spirit of truth has already been given to all those who believe. Amen. Love his word. Hear his wisdom. May your days be extended. Amen. Hallelujah. Let this be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Amen. Amen. May you gain more than silver and gold. Hallelujah. That you have God himself in your heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you and will remain with you forever. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. 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 Amen.